tricks, I guess, we've picked up along the way in terms of like how to train things well, uh, things like using the pre-trained model and things like, you know, using the one cycle convergence and all these little tricks. Um, they work extraordinarily well. Um, and it's really nice to be able to like show something in class where we can say, you know, I, uh, we actually haven't published the paper on the, the exact details of how this um, variation of the unit works. There's a few little tweaks we do. Um, but uh, if you come back for part two, we'll be going into all of the details about how we make this um, work so well. Uh, but for you, all you have to know at this stage is that you can say learner.createUnit and you should get great results also. Um, there's another trick you can use if you're um, running out of um, uh, memory a lot, which is you can actually do something called um, mixed precision training. And uh, mixed precision training means that instead of using, for those of you that have done a little bit of computer science, instead of using a single precision floating point numbers, um, you can do all the most of the calculations in your model with half precision floating point numbers, so 16 bits instead of 32 bits. Um, tradition, I mean, the, the very idea of this has only been around really for the last couple of years uh, in terms of like hardware that actually does this reasonably quickly. Um, uh, and then uh, fast AI library, I think, is the first and probably still the only that makes it actually easy to use this. If you add to FP16 on the end of any learner call, um, you're actually going to get a model that trains um, in 16-bit precision. Um, because it's so new, uh, you'll need to have kind of the most recent CUDA drivers and all that stuff for this even to work. Um, when I tried it this morning um, on some of the platforms, it just killed the kernel. Um, so you need to make sure you've got the most recent drivers. Um, but if you've got a really recent GPU, like a, a 2080 Ti, um, not only will it work, but it'll work about twice as fast um, as otherwise. Now, the reason I'm mentioning it is that it's going to use less GPU RAM. Um, so even if you don't have like a 2080 Ti, um, you might find, or you'll probably find that things that didn't fit into your GPU without this uh, then do fit in with this. Now, I actually have never seen people use 16 uh, mixed precision floating point for segmentation before. Um, just for a bit of a laugh, I tried it um, and actually discovered that I got an even better result. So I only found this this morning, so I don't have anything more to add here other than um, quite often when you make things a little bit less precise in deep learning, it generalizes a little bit better. And I, you know, I've never seen a 92.5 accuracy on Canvid before. So yeah, this not only will this be faster, you'll be able to use bigger batch sizes, um, but you might even find, like I did, that you get an even better result. So that's a cool little trick. Uh, you just need to make sure that every time you create a learner, you add this to FP16. If your kernel dies, it probably means you have um, slightly out of date CUDA drivers, or maybe even an old, too old graphics card. Um, I'm not sure exactly which cards support FP16. Um, okay, so um, one more before we kind of rewind. Um, sorry, two more. Uh, the first one I'm going to show you is um, an interesting data set called the BWE HeadPose data set. Um, and uh, Gabriel Finale was kind enough to give us permission to use this in the class. Um, uh, his team uh, created this, uh, this cool data set. Here's what the data set looks like. It's um, pictures. Um, it's actually got a few things in it. We're just going to do a simplified version. And one of the things they do is they have a dot saying um, this is the center of uh, the face. Um, and so we're going to try and create a model that can find the center of a face. So um, for, for this data set, um, there's a few data set specific things we have to do, which um, I don't really even understand, but I just know from the readme that you have to. They used some kind of a depth sensing camera. I think they actually used a, a Connect, you know, Xbox Connect. Um, there's some kind of calibration numbers that they provide in a little file, which I had to read in. And then they provided a little function um, that you have to use to take their coordinates to change it from this 
this depth sensor calibration thing to end up with actual coordinates. So when you, when you open this and you see these little conversion routines, um, that's just, you know, I'm just doing what they told us to do, basically. It's got nothing particularly to do with deep learning to end up with this dot. Um, the interesting bit really is uh, where we um, create uh, something which is not an image or an image segment, but an image points. Um, and we'll mainly learn about this later in the course, um, but basically uh, image points um, use this idea of, uh, of kind of the coordinates, right? They're not pixel values, they're, they're x, y coordinates. There's just two numbers. Um, as you can see, um, let me see. Um, okay. So here's an example for a particular image file name, uh, this particular image file, and here it is. Um, the coordinates of the center of the face are at 263, 428, um, and here it is. Um, so there's just two numbers which represent whereabouts on this picture is the center of the face. So if we're going to create a model that can find the center of a face, we need a neural network that spits out two numbers. But note, this is not a classification model. These are not two numbers that you look up in a list to find out that they're road or building or ragdoll cat or whatever. They're actual locations. So, um, so far everything we've done has been a classification model, something that's created labels or classes. Um, this for the first time is what we'd call a regression model. A lot of people think regression means linear regression. It doesn't. Regression just means any kind of model where your output is some continuous number or set of numbers. So this is, we need to create an image regression model, something that can predict these two numbers. So how do you do that? Um, same way as always, right? So we can actually just say, I've got a list of image files, it's in a folder, and I want to label them using this function that we wrote that basically does the stuff that the readme says to grab the uh, coordinates out of their text files. So that's going to give me the two numbers for every one. And then I'm going to split it according to some function. And so in this case, um, the, the, the files they gave us, again, they're from videos. And so I picked just one folder to be my validation set. In other words, a different person. So again, I was trying to think about like how do I validate this fairly. So I said, well, the, uh, the fair validation would be to make sure that it works well on a person that it's never seen before. So my validation set is all going to be a particular person. Uh, create a data set. And so this data set, I just tell it what kind of data set is it? Well, they're going to be a set of points. So points means, you know, specific coordinates. Do some transforms. Again, I have to say transform y equals true because that red dot needs to move if I flip or rotate or warp. Um, pick some size, I just picked a size that's going to work pretty quickly, create a data bunch, normalize it, and again, show batch, there it is, okay? I noticed that their um, red dots don't always seem to be quite in the middle of the face. I don't know exactly what their kind of internal algorithm for putting dots on. It kind of sometimes looks like it's meant to be the nose, but sometimes it's not quite the nose. Anyway, you get the, it's, it's somewhere around the center of the face or the nose. So how do we create a model? We create a CNN. Um, uh, but um, we're going to be learning a lot about loss functions in the next few lessons. Um, but generally, the, the, basically, the loss function is that, that, that number that says how good is the model. And so for classification, uh, we use this loss function called cross entropy loss, which says basically, uh, you remember this from earlier uh, lessons, um, did you predict the correct class? And were you confident of that prediction? Now, we can't use that for regression. So instead, we use something called mean squared error. And if you remember from last lesson, we actually implemented mean squared error from scratch. It's just the difference between the two squared and added up together. Okay, so we need to tell it this is not classification, so we use mean squared error. Um, Um, so this is not classification, so we have to use mean squared error. 
And then once we've created the learner, we've told it what last function to use, we can go ahead and do LR find. We can then fit. And you can see here, within a minute and a half, our mean squared error is 0.0004. Now the nice thing is about like mean squared error, that's very easy to interpret, right? So we're trying to predict something um, which is somewhere around a few hundred, and we're getting a squared error on average of 0.0004, so we can feel pretty confident that this is a really good model, and then we can look at the results by learn.showResults, and we can see predictions, ground truth, it's doing a nearly perfect job, okay? So that's how you can do um, image regression models. So anytime you've got something you're trying to predict, which is some continuous value, you use an approach that's something like this. So, um, last example before we look at some kind of more foundational theory stuff, um, um, NLP. And uh, next week we're going to be looking at a lot more NLP. Um, but let's now do the same thing, but rather than creating a classification of pictures, Let's try and classify um, documents. And so we're going to go through this in a lot more detail next week, but let's do the quick version. Um, rather than importing from fastai.vision, I now import for the first time from fastai.text. That's where you'll find all the application-specific stuff for analyzing text documents. And in this case, we're going to use a data set called IMDB. And IMDB has lots of movie reviews. They're generally about a couple of thousand words. Um, and each movie review has been classified as either negative or positive. So um, it's just in a CSV file, so we can use pandas to read it, we can take a little look, we can take a look at a, a review. Um, and basically, as per usual, we can either use um, factory methods or the data block API to create a data bunch. So here's the quick way to create a data bunch from a CSV of texts, data bunch from CSV, and that's that. Um, and yeah, at this point, I could create a learner and start training it, um, but we're going to show you a little bit more detail, which we're mainly going to look at next week. Um, the steps that actually happen when you create these data bunches is there's a few steps. Um, the first is it does something called tokenization which is it takes those words uh, and it converts them into a standard form of tokens, where there's basically each token represents a word, but it does things like, see here, see how didn't has been turned here into two separate words? And you see how everything's been lowercased? See how your has been turned into two separate words? So tokenization is trying to make sure that each, um, each token each, each thing that we've got with spaces around it here represents a single, you know, linguistic concept, okay? Um, also, um, it finds words that are really rare, like really rare names uh, and stuff like that, and replaces them with a special token called unknown. So anything starting with XX in FastAI is some special token. Um, so this is tokenization. So we end up with something where we've got a list of uh, tokenized words. You'll also see that things like punctuation end up with spaces around them to make sure that they're separate tokens. Um, the next thing we do is we take um, uh, a complete unique list of all of the possible tokens. That's called the vocab, uh, and that gets created for us. And so here's the first 10 items of the vocab. So here is every possible token, the first 10 of them, that appear in our, all of the movie reviews. And we then replace every movie review with a list of numbers. And the list of numbers simply says what numbered thing in the vocab is in this place. So here 6 is 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So this is the word a. Ah. And this is 3, 0, 1, 2, 3. This was a comma, and so forth. Right? So through um, tokenization and numericalization, this is the standard way in NLP of turning a document into a list of numbers. Um, we can do that with the data block API, right? So this time it's not image files list, it's uh, text split data uh, from a CSV, convert them to data sets, tokenize them, 
numericalize them, create a data bunch, and at that point, um, we can start to create a model. Um, as we'll learn about next week, um, when we do NLP classification, we actually create two models. Uh, the first model is something called a language model, um, which, as you can see, we train in a kind of a usual way. We say we want to create a language model learner. We train it. Uh, we can save it. We unfreeze. We train some more. And then after we've created a language model, we fine-tune it to create the classifier. So here's the thing where we create the data bunch for the classifier. We create a learner. Um, we train it. Um, and we end up with some accuracy. So uh, that's the really quick version. We're going to go through it in more detail next week. But you can see the basic idea of training an NLP classifier is very, very, very similar to creating every other model we've seen so far. And uh, this accuracy, uh, so the current state of the art for IMDB classification is actually um, the algorithm that uh, we built and published with a um, colleague called, uh, named Sebastian Ruder. And um, this basically, what I just showed you, is pretty much the state of the art algorithm with some minor tweaks. You can get this up to about 95% um, if you try really hard. So this is very close to the state of the art accuracy uh, that we developed. There's a question. Okay, now's a great time for a question. For a data set very different than ImageNet, like the satellite images or genomic images shown in Lesson 2, we should use our own stats. Jeremy once said, if you're using a pre-trained model, you need to use the same stats it was trained with. Why is that? Isn't it that normalized data with its own stats will have roughly the same distribution like ImageNet? The only thing I can think of which may differ is skewness. Is it the possibility of skewness or something else the reason of your statement? And does that mean you don't recommend using pre-trained models with very different data sets, like the one-point mutation that you mentioned in lesson two? Uh, no. Nope. Um, as you can see, I've used pre-trained models for all of those things. Uh, every time I've used an ImageNet pre-trained model and every time I've used ImageNet stats. Uh, why is that? Um, because that model was trained with those stats. Right? So, for example, imagine you're trying to classify different types of green frogs. So, if you were to use your own per channel means from your data set, you would end up converting them to a mean of zero, a standard deviation of one for each of your red, green, and blue channels, which means they don't look like green frogs anymore. They now look like gray frogs, right? But ImageNet, expects frogs to be green, okay? So you need to normalize with the same stats that the ImageNet training people normalized with, otherwise the unique characteristics of your data set won't appear anymore. You actually normalize them out in terms of the per-channel statistics. So you should always use the same stats that the model was trained with. Um, okay, so in every case, um, what we're doing here is we're um, using gradient descent uh, with mini batches, so stochastic gradient descent, to fit some parameters of a model. And um, uh, those parameters are parameters to basically matrix multiplications. In the second half of this part, we're actually going to learn about a little tweak called convolutions, but it's a basically a type of matrix multiplication. The thing is, though, no amount of matrix multiplications is possibly going to create something that can read IMDB movie reviews and decide if it's positive or negative, or look at satellite imagery and decide whether it's got a road in it. Um, that's far more than a linear classifier can do. Now, we know these are deep neural networks, and deep neural networks create, contain lots of these matrix multiplications, but every matrix multiplication is just a, a, a linear model, and a, lo a linear function on top of a linear function is just another linear function, right? Um, if you remember back to your, um, you know, high school math, you might remember that if you, you know, have a y equals ax plus b, and then you stick another, you know, um, c, y plus d on top of that, it's still just another slope and another intercept. So 
no amount of stacking matrix multiplications is going to help in the slightest. So what are these models actually? What are we actually doing? And um, here's the interesting thing. Um, all we're actually doing is we uh, literally do have a matrix multiplication or a slight variation like a convolution that we'll learn about. Um, but after each one, um, we do something called a, uh, a nonlinearity or an activation function. Um, an activation function is something that takes the result of that matrix multiplication and sticks it through some function. And um, these are some of the functions that we use. Um, in the old days, um, the most common function that we used to use was um, basically this shape. Uh, these shapes are, are called um, sigmoid. Um, and they have, you know, particular mathematical definitions. Um, nowadays, we almost never use those for these um, between each matrix multiply. Nowadays, we nearly always use this one. It's called a rectified linear unit. Uh, it's very important when you're doing deep learning to use big long words that sound impressive. Otherwise, normal people might think they can do it too. But um, <laughs> just between you and me, a rectified linear unit is defined using the following function. That's it. Okay, so um, and if you want to be really exclusive, of course, you then um, shorten the long version and you call it a ReLU to show that you're really in the exclusive, in the exclusive team. So this is a ReLU activation. Right? So here's the crazy thing. If you take your red, green, blue pixel inputs and you chuck them through a matrix multiplication and then you replace the negatives with zero, and you put it through another matrix multiplication, you place the negative to zero, and you keep doing that again and again and again, you have a deep learning neural network. That's it, right? So how the hell does that work? So an uh, extremely cool guy called Michael Nielsen um, showed how this works. Um, he has a very nice uh, uh, website. It's actually more than a website, it's a book. Um, ne Neuralnetworksanddeeplearning.com. And he has these beautiful little um, JavaScript things where you can get to play around um, because this was back in the old days. This was back when we used to use sigmoids, right? And what he shows is that if you have enough um, little, he shows these little matrix multiplications. If you have enough little matrix multiplications followed by sigmoids, and exactly the same thing works for a matrix multiplication followed by a ReLU, you can actually create arbitrary shapes, right? And um, so this, this, uh, this idea that these combinations of, um, of uh, linear functions and nonlinearities can create arbitrary shapes actually has a name. And this name is the Universal Approximation Theorem. Um, and what it says is that if you have stacks of um, linear functions and nonlinearities, uh, the thing you end up with can uh, approximate any function arbitrarily closely. So you just need to make sure that you have a big enough matrix to multiply by or enough of them. Um, so if you have, you know, now this, 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 this function, which is just a sequence of matrix multiplies and nonlinearities, where the nonlinearities can be, you know, basically any of these things, um, we normally use this one. Um, if that can approximate anything, then all you need is some way to find the particular values of the, of the weight matrices in your matrix multiplies that solve the problem you want to solve. And we already know how to find the values of parameters. We can use gradient descent. And so that's actually it, right? And this is the bit I find the hardest thing normally to explain to students is that we're actually done now. People often come up to me after this lesson and they say, what, what's the rest? Please explain to me the rest of deep learning. But like, no, there's no rest. Like, we have a function where we take our input pixels or whatever, we multiply them by some weight matrix, we replace the negatives with zeros, we multiply it by another weight matrix, we replace the negatives with zeros, we do that a few times, we see how close it is to our target, and then we use gradient descent to update our weight matrices using the derivatives, and we do that a few times, 
and eventually we end up with something that can classify movie reviews or can recognize pictures of ragdoll cats. That, that's actually it. Okay, so it's, it's, the reason it's hard to understand intuitively is because we're talking about weight matrices that have, you know, once you add them all up, something like 100 million parameters. They're very big weight matrices, right? So your intuition about what multiplying something by a linear model and replacing the negatives with zeros a bunch of times can do, your intuition doesn't hold, right? You just have to accept empirically the truth is doing that works really well. So in part two of the course, we're actually going to build these from scratch, right? Um, but I mean, just to skip ahead, you basically will find that, you know, it's going to be kind of five lines of code, right? It's going to be a little for loop that goes, you know, t equals, you know, x at weight matrix one, um, t2 equals max of t comma zero, stick that in a for loop that goes through each weight matrix, and at the end, calculate my loss function. Um, and of course, we're not going to calculate the gradients ourselves because PyTorch does that for us. Um, and that's about it. So, um, okay, question. Um, there's a question about tokenization. I'm curious about how tokenizing words works when they depend on each other, such as San Francisco. Yeah, okay. Um, Okay, tokenization. How do you tokenize something like San Francisco? San Francisco contains two tokens, San Francisco. That's it, that's how you tokenize San Francisco. Um, the question may be coming from um, people who have done like traditional NLP, um, often need to kind of use these things called n-grams. Um, and n-grams are kind of this idea of like, like a, a lot of NLP in the old days was all built on top of linear models where you basically counted how many times particular strings of text appeared like the phrase San Francisco. That would be a, a bigram or an n-gram with an n of two. Um, the cool thing is that with deep learning, we don't have to worry about that. Like, like with many things, a lot of the complex feature engineering disappears when you do deep learning. So with deep learning, each token is literally just a word, or in the case that the word really consists of two words, like your, um, you split it into two words. Um, and then what we're going to do is we're going to then um, let the deep learning model figure out how best to combine words together. Now when we say, like, let the deep learning model figure it out, of course, all we really mean is um, find the weight matrices using gradient descent to give the right answer. Like, there's not really much more to it than that. Um, again, there's some minor tweaks, right? Um, in the second half of the course, we're going to be learning about the particular tweak for image models, which is using a convolution. There'll be a CNN. For language, there's a particular tweak we do called um, using recurrent models or an RNN, but they're very minor tweaks on, on what we've just described. So basically, it turns out with an RNN, um, that it, it can learn that San plus Francisco has a different meaning when those two things are together. Some satellite images have four channels. How can we deal with data that has four channels or two channels when using pre-trained models? Um, yeah, that's a good question. I think that's something that we're gonna try and um, incorporate into fast AI. So hopefully by the time you watch this video, there'll be easier ways to do this. Um, but uh, the basic idea is um, a pre-trained image net model expects red, green, and blue pixels. So if you've only got two channels, um, there's a few things you can do. Um, but basically you'll want to create a third channel. Um, and so you can create the third channel as uh, either being all zeros or it could be the average of the other two channels. Um, and so you can just use, you know, normal PyTorch arithmetic 
to create that third channel. Uh, you could either do that ahead of time in a little loop and save your three channel versions, or you could create a custom data set class that does that um, on demand. Um, for four channel, um, you probably don't want to get rid of the fourth channel. So instead, what you'd have to do is to actually modify the model itself. So to know how to do that, we'll only know how to do that in a couple more lessons time. Um, but basically the idea is that the initial um, weight matrix, um, weight matrix is really the wrong term. They're not weight matrices, they're weight tensors. Um, so they can have more than just two dimensions. Um, so that weight, that initial weight matrix in the neural net, um, it's going to have, it's actually a tensor, and uh, one of its axes is going to have three, uh, uh, whatever, three uh, slices in it. Uh, so you would just have to change that to add an extra slice, um, which I would generally just initialize to zero or to some random numbers. Um, so that's the short version. Um, but really to answer this, to understand exactly what I meant by that, we're going to need a couple more lessons to get there. Okay. So um, wrapping up, um, what have we looked at today? Basically, um, we started out by saying, um, um, hey, it's really easy now to create web apps. We've got starter kits for you um, that show you how to create web apps, and people have created some really cool web apps using what we've learned so far, which is um, single label classification. Um, but the cool thing is, the exact same steps we use to do single label classification, you can also do to do um, multi-label classification, um, such as um, in the planet, uh, or you could use to do segmentation, uh, or you could use to do Uh, or you could use to do um, any kind of image regression. Uh, or, and this is probably a bit early for you to actually try this yet, you could do for NLP classification and a lot more. So, um, and in, in each case, um, all we're actually doing is we're doing gradient descent on not just two um, parameters, but on maybe 100 million parameters, but it's still just plain gradient descent. Uh, along with a nonlinearity, which is normally this one, which it turns out the universal approximation theorem tells us, lets us arbitrarily accurately approximate any given function, including functions such as converting a spoken waveform into the thing the person was saying, or converting a sentence in Japanese to a sentence in English, or converting a picture of a dog into the word dog. These are all mathematical functions that we can learn using this approach. So this week, see if you can come up with an interesting idea of um, a problem that you would like to solve, which is either multi-label classification or image regression or image segmentation, or something like that, uh, and see if you can try to solve that problem. You will probably find the hardest part of solving that problem is coming up, creating the data bunch, and so then you'll need to dig into the data block API to try to figure out how to create the data bunch from the data you have. And um, with some practice, uh, you will start to get pretty good at that. It's not a huge API, there's a small number of pieces, um, it's also very easy to add your own. But for now, um, you know, ask on the forum if you try something and you get stuck. Um, Okay, great. So um, next week, we're going to come back and we're going to look at some more NLP. Um, we're going to learn uh, uh, some more about some details about how we actually train with SGD quickly. We're going to learn about things like Atom um, and uh, RMS prop and so forth. And hopefully, we're also going to show off lots of really cool um, web apps and uh, models that you've all built during the week. So I'll see you then. Thanks. <laughs>